Hey folks, so we're here today with CSS Audio, uh, Dan and Carrie. Um, yeah, so I'm starting a series here because we're stuck at home. Uh, we're just gonna interview a bunch of great minds in this industry. So CSS Audio, uh, just to give you a little background, um, I reviewed their finished speaker and also just recently built their uh, uh, kit, uh, 1TD kit, which is right now being nicely finished in uh, veneer. So that's going to be coming up for a video very soon. I'm very excited about that. Um, but today we're going to be concentrating on the masterminds behind CSS Audio. So we have Carrie and we have Carrie, you want to wave your hand? So we have Carrie there and then we have Dan. Hey, Dan, wave, wave your hand. There you go. <laughs> OK, so we're going to ask them a set of questions, very difficult questions, um, so they can uh, give you guys some insight into their company. So let's start with um, the first question, and we'll start with Kerry. Uh, when did you first become an audio uh, audiophile? First audiophile experience that converted you? So my story, I don't think, is nearly as entertaining as Dan's. Uh, so I I don't really have a like a specific instance like Dan does that uh, really triggered me to be an audiophile. I think it's because I I grew up playing instruments all my life. Uh, so I, I started uh, playing trumpet around the I was probably ten years old or so when I started. Um, and then I picked up guitar later on. And uh, when I really started getting into like higher end audio was uh, when I was in high school, I started to get into car audio. And, uh, you know, everybody else at my school was building, you know, cheap, make it as loud as possible, boomy subwoofers. And I always thought they sounded terrible. And the only like real experience that I remember specifically where I was like, holy crap, that sounds awesome. Uh, like when I was younger was I was walking through a mall and it, I don't know if you remember this brand. Uh, their Eclipse Audio, they went out of business a while back, but they made some really nice subwoofers. And they had uh, one of their Eclipse Titanium subwoofers playing in this car audio store as I was walking by. And I was like, man, that bass just sounds so clean. That's that's what I want in my car. And so I started, you know, basically in car audio and then progressed to home audio. Like once I started understanding more about how everything works, because you can get a lot better sound, you know, in, in your home setup than you can in your car due to all the limitations. Uh, I just basically, you know, progressed from there. Awesome, cool. Uh, trick question: What what uh, car audio system did you have? What consisted of it? Uh, so <laughs> my first one was like a pair of Sony speakers uh, from Walmart, <laughs> and a <laughs> and like a an old Kenwood uh, head unit. Uh, but I I upgraded from that to uh, CDT separates. Uh, I don't know. It, it's kind of a smaller. Uh, like less well-known brand, but CDT Audio was what I used, uh, a pair of their separates. And then I used uh, uh, an Audio Mobile, another company that went out of business, uh, one of their 12-inch subwoofers. That's what I had for a long time. Awesome. Cool. So Dan, uh, how about you? How did you uh, become an audiophile? So I don't know if this is the story that, uh, that Carrie is referring to there, but uh, I, I remember, uh, you know, as a kid, I wasn't really into music and then uh, my parents took me to Cedar Point and I heard the Cedar Point band you know it was like a four-piece band like a tuba and a trom two trombones and a trumpet and they played Led Zeppelin's Black Dog and and I it kind of blew my mind and I just asked my dad what is this and he kind of looked shocked that I was interested and told me it was Led Zeppelin and uh, ever since then I've been into music and then uh, you know started tinkering with the the cheap stereos that I'd have and tear apart the speakers and try to build them up a little bit better and you learn a little bit at a time and, and, and make something pretty cool at one point that sounds better than what you've heard in the stores. And I was hooked ever since then. Awesome. Awesome. Let's go to the second question. Uh, what were some of your first speakers? <laughs> um, so like my original first speakers were again, kind of like those, uh, all-in-one CD player, boombox kind of things. It was like an IWA system or something. Uh, that was like literally my first stereo that I ever bought. Uh, but it came with like a, a separate subwoofer, so it was awesome to me at the time. I was like 15 when I bought it. Um, and then I later, uh, when I went into college, I bought a pair of like lower-end JBL uh, bookshelves that I had for a long time. And those were actually like decent quality for you know being like $100 speakers. Uh, from do that, you, do you the, remember the model? I can't remember the model. It was one of the, okay. it's not the Northridge. It was the, like the even cheaper one than that. Uh, they, okay. Um, yeah, not, not like a classic model that people recognize the, the, well, it was your first speaker, right? So, yeah, exactly. <laughs> uh, 
and so then I, I ended up buying a pair of B&Ws later on. Um, and from there, that's when I started doing DIY and I ended up replacing those. And I haven't bought a pair of commercial speakers since I, I build all my stuff now. Awesome. Awesome. So uh, I'm going to add a trick question to that. Um, what, what made you go from commercially available speakers to, uh, you know, tinkering and then eventually saying, you know, I'm just going to build my own? <laughs> yeah, no, that's a great question. Um, so I think what it was, I, I mean, I, I grew up, my dad like builds everything himself, like fixes everything himself. So I kind of had like that do it yourself mentality. I like building things. And so I wanted to kind of get into it, um, but I never really understood how. I think it wasn't until I went through, uh, I was in the Navy for a while. I was a submarine officer and we go through nuclear power training. Plus we learn a lot of acoustics and stuff like that. I, once I was able to start putting some of that stuff together, I went ahead and like jumped in and tried to do a speaker. Um, it didn't go great, but I built a kit speaker from somebody else um, that sounded pretty good. And I was pretty surprised at how good it sounded for costing like $120. Uh, so from there I was just kind of hooked and I wanted to keep going like down the rabbit hole of learning, uh, you know, what I could do with, uh, with, uh, better quality drivers and things like that. Awesome. How about you then? So my, uh, you know, I had a similar story to carry kind of, you know, I had a, this, this boom box and then upgraded to the next, you know, boom box. Uh, I could finally afford a Sony boom box at some point, you know, the, the, the brand name one. And, and then I think I had a, a Technics receiver with some probably some fisher some cheap klh speakers um but but uh when i graduated high school i took all my uh all my graduation money and bought a uh, ad comp separates and a pair of paradigm i think they were nine se make threes man that stuff sounded real good even even by today's standards that was some pretty good stuff uh, and and to continue with your trick question about you know the the diy versus commercial for me i was actually it, it kind of was parallel. So I was, I was into just messing around with speakers, but they didn't sound as good as what I could buy. So they were, they were kind of separate for a little while. Um, you know, the, the stuff that I could make sounded nowhere as good as, as, as the paradigms. Uh, so then as I kind of drifted out of the hobby and came back into it, and there's a lot of, a lot of free software available where, like Carrie was saying, you can start to actually learn what you're doing and uh, do some studying and some experimentation and, and start to equal the commercial speakers pretty quickly, even even the B&Ws and the paradigms. Yeah, and then there's no reason for you to look back, basically. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, because the DIY stuff is, is more fun. And if you, mm -hmm. can, if you can match or beat the commercial stuff, what's, what's the point of, of buying commercial speakers anymore? Right, and when you build it, it's like your baby. <laughs> Yes, it is. I I, I, I that's remember the, that's the other element that people don't get. Yeah, yeah. I, I remember that uh, I I first attempted to build uh, myself an L three five A um because uh the 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 used market and the the revision of, of the um, new L three five A was uh, quite expensive. So I tried building my own, and yep. um, I had a similar experience with you. It just didn't sound right. <laughs> it just didn't sound right <laughs> until, and it, it was so you know I I thought. I looked at the LS35A, right? I looked at the crossover. I looked at the cabinet. You know, I looked at practically everything and it looked like a freaking darn simple speaker. What could go wrong? But when I actually went to build it, you know, everything went wrong. So I, I totally get that. But once you get it right, it, for sure, it's, uh, it's a fun thing to do, especially all the time that went into it. Um, <clears throat> the third question, uh, tell me about CSS Audio. How did it start? Uh, what was the goal of the brand? So uh, it's kind of an interesting story because CSS actually started out as a Canadian company. Um, so it was uh, originally started by Bob Reimer. Uh, Dan, do you remember the, the actual founding day? It was like 2002 or something like that? I, I think it was 2001. So like a, a while ago. Um, but he had uh, he kind of become known for um, like ha selling some high quality drivers. Mm -hmm. uh, and since we were in the DIY world, we kind of knew about those drivers. Uh, a few years ago, he was looking to get out of the business. He had uh, he he's was fairly old at that point, and I think he had come down with some illnesses, and he was trying to pay off some medical bills. He couldn't keep up with with CSS anymore. So we offered to buy him out because uh, we were really interested in doing this. Like we had discussed, you know, starting our own company for a while, and uh, it just seemed like the right opportunity to do it. 
So we we took over from him, and we uh, I think one of the things that we've tried to do since we've taken over is uh, kind of focus the company a bit more. He sold a lot of stuff like Parts Express or Madison does just in Canada. He was kind of set up to do that based on where he lived. Uh, he could you know transport stuff across the border, but we wanted to really make this a a company that was focused on selling either uh, high quality drivers, um, just a few high quality drivers that really do some specific things very well, or uh, you know kits that make it kits and, and finished speakers that make it easy for people to get into uh, you know really high end sound for a reasonable price. So you kind of want to focus focus it down. I see. Yeah. I see. And I guess Dan, uh, did you have anything to add to that? Yeah, I mean, we even, you know, just a little bit more detail on what Kerry was talking about focusing. There was even some some drivers that we felt um, were not at the top level of, you know, we, we feel if, if, if someone has a certain set of requirements, we want a CSS driver. If it fills those requirements, we want it to be the best driver that's available for those specific requirements. And there was even a few drivers that we felt didn't really fall into that category. And so we let those go by the wayside and focused more on the... Um, on the drivers that that are at the top echelon of their of their group, um, and and we're we're continuing to develop some more drivers that that will fit into that category. Right. So you're focusing more on the quality um, and and focusing on specific uh, set of drivers instead of having multiple drivers and stuff like that. I guess. Correct. I, I just Correct. hit my light. <laughs> okay. Um, uh, I guess the next question is. Why DIY kits? Why did you guys decide to do DIY kits? Um, so, uh, as we mentioned, you know, we both came up kind of building our own stuff before we started the company. I think a lot of, you know, smaller companies start out that way. Well, even a lot of large companies, you know, start out that way. Uh, but they, uh, what we really wanted to do is uh, high end audio can get ridiculously overpriced. And um, I, I've taken apart a lot of other high-end brands. I won't name any names, but some of them are shocking, like the quality of the parts that are inside them. And you know, every manufacturer has price points that they have to hit to be able to make the profit that they need to stay open and to pay their employees and everything. We understand that you know our, our finished speakers aren't cheap, but we knew that there's um, you know there's a lot of savings you can have if you sell things in a kit version. If people are willing to put in the labor for building it, uh, the the assembly, the finish work themselves, we can offer things at a significantly lower price, but still give them essentially the high-end sound. It, it just may not look quite as high-end. And so we really wanted to open it up. Uh, you know, Part of this was designing kits that were very, very easy to assemble because they're not always necessarily the most approachable thing. The first time I was looking at you know, building a kit, it's a, you know, just a schematic online that you're looking at and you're trying to order the parts. You don't know if this part subs for this part or whatever. So we just sell everything like all packaged neatly together. Uh, where you've got every single piece that you need to build except for essentially the wood glue and the solder. That's really the only thing you need to finish our kit. So it makes it a lot easier, makes it more approachable for the average person to build. You don't have to be an expert in electronics or a, a DIYer to really do it. Yeah, I, I uh, just to add on to that from you know, uh, from my experience of building uh, one of your DIY kits, I really, really appreciated that because you know, I, I, I literally, it took me less than two hours to finish it, including the soldering of the uh, crossover. Now, mind yeah. you, I've done this before, but even, even then, even if I had no clue, um, you know, it would have taken me, you know, less than five, five hours, uh, or the day to do it because, you know, I, I set out to do, uh, DIY speakers and build my own. And, um, and actually in the background of the video that I did where I was building your uh, kid speaker there was a speaker sitting in the uh, background and uh, in the comment section some of my viewers are asking me what is that well that was the speaker that I built and it's made out of hard wood you know I took me the CSS audio kit took me a few hours that speaker alone took me hours of work like months of work just you know banging my head against the wall and guess what I, in the comment section, if you go right now, you can check it out. Someone asked me, how does it compare to CSS Audio? The parts alone go, that, and time alone that went to, into that speaker is ridiculous. And it sounds, <laughs> the CSS Audio sounds much better. So I really appreciated that because it's, it feels so good. You know, it's the last thing you want is build a speaker, put all this time into it uh, on your first try, especially. And because those are those are the one of the uh, first speakers that I built and make a sound and you played them back and just sounds not right. And just doesn't, you know, it, it's like you don't feel accomplished. 
Whereas the CSS Audio Kit, everything is made simple, and you know, you play it back, and you know, I felt so accomplished. Even though everything was pr yeah. practically like a puzzle, it, I felt so accomplished. So, um, I think I think I can definitely speak for that. Uh, how about you, Dan? Um, anything you want to add to that? Well, yeah, I mean, what Carrie said, and then, and then what you just added. I mean, DIY is is fun, you know. So we've there's a couple components to this hobby where we we enjoy good, well recorded music that sounds great. We want to get invo em emotionally involved while we listen to the music. And then we there's some of us that like to tinker and like to build and like to to create those things ourselves. And um, Carrie and I are both like that, and that's why DIY was a natural fit for us. And we want to reach out and 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 connect with people who also feel that way. Um, on top of that, you start to remove a little bit of the, the mystique that is in audio about, you know, the magic of what makes things sound good. And you can really start to break through some of that in DIY when you're sitting with all the components right in front of your face and, and you know exactly what goes into it. You know that it's just, you know, sturdy construction on the cabinet and high quality drivers and high quality crossover components. And then the design elements that go into it, you know, when you, you, you lengthen the port to just the right length for that volume and you see all these things that go into it, some of the mystery starts to disappear, and you can say, hey, I, I know what it takes to make good sound now, and I can let that uh, drive my decisions in the future. Yeah, and uh, you know, talking about you know, uh, f feeling accomplished, you know, um, I, I felt a little bit, you know, I always try to stay away, because as a reviewer, I have to stay away from uh, being biased in any way. And, you know, it, it kind of, <laughs> it was kind of hard because it's like my baby, right? And then it's like, how can, <laughs> it sounds good, but it seems like it sounds even more better because I built it. <laughs> That's true. But that, that just adds to it though, right? I, yeah. mean, I mean, whether it does or doesn't, if you feel that way, that's fantastic. It, it feels better while you're listening to it. Exactly. Yeah. Okay, so next question. Uh, what if something goes wrong uh, because the person never did it before? Now, as easy as your kits can be uh, for anyone in every, any type of um, experience, um, there, there can be, you know, things that go wrong, um, you know, when you're building a speaker. For example, you know, uh, maybe the cabinet didn't, you know, uh, uh, clamp on properly or, you know, it's a first timer. So maybe he, you know, did something with the crossover, didn't solder it properly or something. Let's say something goes wrong. Um, what, what, what's the process that you go through to help those customers? So uh, we're, uh, you know, available. Uh, we, we provide pretty quick feedback via email to most of our customers who, who message us. Um, the, it's really hard to, I would say, break anything in our kit. Uh, the only way I think you could probably mess something up is if you soldered it in the wrong connection and then you tried to cut it to go back and you didn't have enough wire or something like that. But for the most part, honestly, we really haven't had, we, we've had one customer who contacted us that followed like a, a video that he saw online of somebody building our kit where the the person who built it had actually left off one of the connections when they showed the the bottom of the board and he built it the way that the, the video had built it. So he called us saying, hey, the tweeter's not working. Um, and we, we figured out what the problem was and got it fixed pretty quickly. But that's honestly like outside of that, we've had some flat packs that like one or two flat packs that got damaged that we shipped uh, because UPS dropped them and we just replaced, you know, the, the part that they, they, they needed. Other than that, we really haven't had too many problems that I can think of. Dan, is there anything you can think of? Uh, no, just to expound on that. I mean, I mean, we worked really hard and, and again, you, you're talking to a couple of guys who have probably built, you know, a hundred pairs of speakers between the two of us. And we've definitely made our own mistakes on our DIY speakers in the past. So we've, we've really thought this through. We've made the board, you know, pretty easy to assemble in terms of having the labeled nodes on the back. Um, we have the, the CNC cabinets that only can go together one way. Um, and if you go step by step through the instructions, um, you know, we recommend that you do a dry fit of the of the cabinet first, just to make sure that everything goes together good. So, if you go step by step, there really shouldn't be any issues. If you have a question ahead of time, feel free to email us. Um, we're we're really pretty responsive when it comes to that. And and besides the one problem that Carrie talked about, we haven't had anybody say, "Hey, the, you know, I, I did did what you said and and it messed up." And you know, that's really important to us because these 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 kits are they're high end speakers. They are supposed to be in a higher echelon, and, and we don't want our customers to, to have some mistake that makes it not sound as good as it could. For sure, for sure. Yeah, um, one thing that I want to add on to that is uh, when I took my speakers, that I, uh, the kit that I built um, from you guys to the guy who was uh, putting on the veneer, um, I traveled to him, and I was like, hey, can you, can you uh, veneer this? And he looked at it, 
and he was like, "Wow, this is really well built. Good job." And I'm like, "I, I well, I, I guess <laughs> it's, a, it's a puzzle." I didn't even use clamps. Um, to tell you the truth, I just used uh, heavy objects, aka speakers, because uh, that's what I have <laughs> for heavy objects. I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna tell uh, you guys what speakers I used, but I used um, heavier side of the speakers to just, you know, have them sit sit there and. Um, you know, the size, none of the size lifted. Um, so that was very easy to, uh, for the veneer guy to do. Cause if you have any size that's lifting, then it may be a little bit harder, but yeah. Um, so yeah, it, <laughs> again, uh, the credit, the credit goes to the wrong side. <laughs> well, we hey, you've been the speakers to assemble <laughs> yet, but <laughs> I'll have to try that next time. <laughs> yes. Um, uh, let's see. Uh, Oh yeah. Um, so you guys build. Uh, you guys basically uh, take each component in the uh, in the kit and decide which one goes into the kit, like which driver, which tweeter, which crossover components, and stuff like that. Uh, what's the process in uh, you know creating a kit? Um, I'm sure it's much different from uh, building a conventional speaker. Um, how do you go about choosing the different components that would go into it? Well, uh, actually, I mean, it's really not that much different than how you would design a conventional speaker. The only difference was we were we weren't really shooting for like a target price point where you may like as a manufacturer you may be trying to hit a thousand dollars. We were just trying to hit the best sound we could get out of the drivers that we had, uh, you know, the CSS branded drivers, and uh, from there we you know just figured out what cost we needed to sell it for to be able to make money to stay in business. Um, when we're looking at the drivers though, like the, the reason, so for instance, like in a, the smaller P215, it uses an SB Acoustics uh, Satori woofer. So we wanted to use a smaller driver so we could offer a smaller bookshelf and then a slightly larger bookshelf. You know, the way that we're choosing the driver that goes with that is uh, you know, frequency response, uh, bass extension for a woofer or high frequency extension for a tweeter, uh, you know, distortion profile to see where we can cross things over without running into distortion problems. Uh, how loud it can play, all, all kinds of things like that are kind of what we're factoring into the driver choices. And then the crossover is a, is a design process. So, you know, we take uh, lots of measurements uh, and then start to do modeling simulations around what we want the frequency response to look like, which we're generally shooting for a, a very flat response. And from there, we tweak by ear until we get the response that we want. And, and that's where we get the components that are in the crossover. Um, the other stuff that is in the kit was all chosen based off of either, uh, you know, how easy it, it went together or how, uh, how we wanted it to, uh, be able to package it so that we could ship it out. Things like that. I see. Uh, anything you want to add to that, Dan? Uh, no, not really. I think Kerry pretty much nailed it. Uh, I mean, you know, I, I, I will just say that, that, you know, going back to what we talked about earlier, where CSS has kind of really focused our, our, our drivers down. So we're already choosing from drivers that we consider to be of the highest quality, you, you know, the top of their category uh, specifications. So um, it, it, it's not it's not hard to choose our drivers because we we've already like I said we've already whittled that down and then the magic comes in the crossover. I mean to get them to play seamlessly together is is where the magic of any speaker is and and I think we do a pretty good job of that. Awesome. I think I have an idea of what you're going to answer to the next question, but the next question uh, is a question that I ask practically anyone that has a uh, business in the speaker world. And I had Eric from Tekton um, answer this question um, for the first time. I've asked Andrew Jones, I've asked, you know, all the speaker builders out there, they always avoided the question. So I'm hoping to get you guys uh, your answer to this. I know that, um, you know, um, everything works well, uh, works together to make a speaker, right? Uh, the crossover, the drivers, uh, the cabinet, it has to all work together to, uh, uh, to reach the end goal. Um, but if you had to choose one part of the speaker, either the driver, the crossover, the cabinet, etc., what is one uh, most vital uh, um, part of a uh, part of a speaker, in your opinion? Yeah, so I think Dan will probably agree with me on this, but really the crossover is like the heart of a speaker. Uh, you can take the most expensive drivers in the world that may measure the best on paper, and if you don't have a good crossover, they can sound terrible. Um, you know, it, it, just buying expensive drivers and putting them in a box with like a pre-made crossover or, a you know, a, a using a crossover calculator you find online won't give you 
you know, super high end sound. I, I've heard drivers that cost a few dollars a piece that people have managed to make sound good because they knew what they were doing in the crossover. That doesn't necessarily mean that it sounds amazing, but like you'd be surprised at the sound you can get with a proper crossover. And then as you go up higher, you know, into better drivers, the sound just keeps getting better and better if you know what you're doing. Awesome. Now it'll be weird if uh, Dan disagrees, but uh, Dan, what do you think? No, I, I agree fully with that, but I, but I will add a caveat to it that that in terms of where you would put your money, you, you'll need to put more money into the the drivers to to get that higher quality. Um, that you know you need to design the crossover, but the crossover components don't necessarily have to cost an arm and a leg. Um, so absolutely, the crossover is the heart of the speaker, and that's where the design work needs to go in. Uh, for a DIY or a commercial design, but the you know where I would allocate uh, financial resource to would probably be in the drivers. I see. So spend the advice here is spend more money on quality drivers instead of buying Mondorf oil filled caps. Yes. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. Um, uh, let's see here. What plays the bigger role in high frequency refinement? Is it the tweeter or the crossover? Um, this one's probably a bit of a combination of both, right? So the, as, as, uh, we said on the last question, you know, stepping up to higher quality drivers will give you better sound or I guess the ability to get better sound, not necessarily better sound. Um, but the crossover obviously has some bearing on that as well. So you can voice a tweeter to be brighter, which may sound, you know, like it's got a lot of detail to begin with, but then may get grating on your ears after you listen to it for a while. Um, whereas if you just voice that tweeter a couple levels down in the crossover, it may be the best tweeter you've ever heard. Um, so it's, it's kind of a combination of, of the two things on that. Okay. Yeah. Uh, you know, the, the, the driver itself will have a certain potential, a certain distortion level, and then it's, it's the job of the crossover to, to, to not mess that up, to let it come through as, as, as clearly and perfectly as possible. Awesome. Just getting the question back here. Mm, just my questions, uh, my message just keeps uh, rolling. People messaging you. Uh, it's like one thing about the pandemic, people message you more. I never yeah. got messages. What's going on? Um, <laughs> what plays the bigger role in bass? Is it the driver, the crossover, or the cabinet? So this one is definitely a combination too, but for different reasons. Uh, so... The, the the cabinet tuning, uh, so if you're doing ported, uh, plays a large role, but obviously the design of the cabinet is going to play off of the woofer that you select. So you're kind of doing this all in conjunction. So you, you select a woofer with certain specs, and then you design the cabinet based on those specs to get the, the kind of the base level that you want. But then part of that sound of that base, not only is the tuning from the cabinet, but also the the quality of the bass itself. So if the if it's a higher distortion bass driver, it may sound a little warmer, uh, maybe get a little funky at higher volumes. If it's lower distortion, sometimes it comes across to people as like drier bass. Uh, so it, it's kind of a combination of a lot of things on that one. About you, Dan? Yeah, no, it's the same same thing. I mean, the, the, yeah. you know, the, the tweeter tweeter is going to be the uh, or the high frequency is going to be the tweeter and the crossover. The low frequency is going to be the the woofer and the enclosure. Um, in terms of the combination, how they play together. Awesome. So I'm not totally clueless. That's uh, that's what I got. Okay, so I know that some companies do only measurements, and I won't name the companies, but I know that companies that do only measurements and do zero listening, and I know companies that do only listening, subjective listening, and don't measure at all. Uh, where does your company stand? Do you guys way heavier on the measurement side or the actual listening side? Um, we're pretty much in the middle of that, I guess. So we, we do a lot of measurements and a lot of listening. Like we spend probably, I, I don't know, we, we do probably 40 to 50 measurements at least per speaker um, that we're designing. And then we spend probably 20 to 30 hours uh, of, of solid, like deep, uh, What's the word I'm looking for? Like detailed listening. Critical. Yeah, critical listening. That's the word I was looking for. So critical <laughs> listening to kind of evaluate the crossover, make sure that we have things uh, exactly where we want it. Because uh, while the measurements definitely 
I, th I think it's very difficult to design without measurements. Uh, if you use the measurements properly and know how to evaluate the measurements, you can get very close to the end sound you're looking for uh, very quickly. But the, those last little tweaks a lot of times can make the difference between a, a good sounding speaker and a great sounding speaker. And that usually comes through, the, through in the listening. Well said. Yeah. Yeah, Jay, and, and you know this from, you've probably listened to a hundred different speakers and you know, some of them just, just grab you. You, you, you know, if you, if you measured it next to the one that didn't grab you, it, it could measure very flat, might look very similar, but there's something about it that just really brings you to an emotional place. And, and that can be a minor tweak. So, so Carrie and I will go through, you know, an entire collection of music that we're extremely familiar with and see what can we do to get this a little bit closer to that place from from one tweak to the next tweak the measurements will look almost the same they'll it'll it'll be you know flattish response with tweaked mm -hmm. kind of how we like it um but but sometimes you know there there might just be something in there that really sits perfectly and and draws you into the song and that's where we want to be and 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 you got to i think you have to listen to get those little magical moments yeah and For just to sure. give you kind of a like an example of the differences between this two so like the the p215 that you reviewed first so we measured that modeled the crossover put it together and then we ended up not tweaking a thing uh we listened to it for a couple hours and we were like this is done we don't need to touch it anymore the one td that you just built i think we spent two months tweaking the crossover on that before we were happy with it yeah awesome uh, let's see. What are some of the measurements taken for your DIY kits and pre-made speakers? Uh, what are I know that there's many different measurements out there, um, but what are some of the measurements that you guys do? Um, is it frequency response? You know, uh, distortion level, whatever it is. Um, give us some insight. Yeah, so we do frequency response uh, both on and off axis to kind of figure out what the the polar response of a speaker is going to look like. Um, you know, part of the polar response is coming from the crossover as well, but this allows us to model it in software. Uh, we do distortion measurements at a couple different levels to see kind of how the driver is going to react under different uh, output levels. Um, and then we do electrical impedance measurements. Um, then we, we basically start our design work from that. And then we measure again once the speaker is assembled to make sure that it's measuring how we expected it to measure uh, and we do kind of another full set of measurements on it once it's finished. Awesome. Anything else, Dan? No, nothing on that one. That's that's pretty technical. <laughs> uh, look, Carrie's taking uh, taking your light. Are you gonna take that? <laughs> all right, that's all right. No, he's, he's a good Just guy like, to be in the light. For sure. Um, uh, let's talk a little bit about your pre-made speakers and its differences to the kits that you have. So, um, I, I you guys have also the P two one five kit, and you also have the finished speaker. Uh, what are the key differences and um, yeah, what are the key differences and what can you, what can the end, end buyer or end user uh, expect from it? Yeah, so uh, we designed the, the kit to be essentially the exact same product that you're getting in the finished speaker minus the fancy looking cabinet. Uh, so that, you know, obviously the cabinets are really attractive, uh, really nicely made, uh, you know, high gloss automotive paint. Uh, exotic wood veneer, so it's you know figured walnut or or the rosewood, and then aluminum you know solid aluminum trim. So th that obviously moves the price up a lot because we're getting these built uh, by a craftsman here in the U.S. Uh, so the labor is not you know cheap on that. But in terms of sonic differences, there's not really any difference between on on the two larger speakers. The baffle's just a little bit thicker. Uh, it's like a half inch thicker, I think, on the the larger speakers, but on the uh, it, that, that, that doesn't really make a significant difference in the sound. They measure identically. They use the same crossover. The only other real difference is that uh, if you buy the finished speaker, uh, it comes standard with the, the upgraded crossover. It doesn't, uh, we don't sell it with the, the uh, cheaper crossover. Yeah, and the, the finished speaker does have the, the rounded over top, which could, you know, have a slight impact on diffraction. Um, but then again, in the in the kit speaker, you can do whatever you want to that too. You can round over the top, you can round over the sides. Yeah. You know, you actually have some more options with the kit speaker than you do with the finished speaker. Other than that, like Harry said, it's uh, it's uh, basically the exact same thing. Yeah, or be lazy and uh, put the fraction pads on. That's <laughs> yeah, all right too. That's DIY, you do whatever you want to, man. Exactly. Um, 
Yeah, uh, just to add on to that, um, a lot of a lot of the comments after I reviewed the finished product was, you know, wow, the price gap between the kit and the finished product is uh, uh, quite a bit. And I just want to, um, you know, if you've never built a speaker, guys, um, uh, I'm talking to the audience. <laughs> kind of feels weird every time I do this. Um, <laughs> Um, if you've never built a uh, speaker before, then if you do, then you will understand why. Building a, the cabinet um, from a, uh, uh, someone who actually builds cabinet it costs quite a bit. Um, even the veneering job costs quite a bit. Um, I had to shop around quite few stores here to uh, uh, to find a store that paid, uh, you know, that wanted um, reasonable money to veneer the speakers. So that's something that uh, you have to keep in mind. Um, and quality cabinet, you know, if you want nice looks, it, it, the price goes up. <laughs> yeah. Um, now let's see here. Uh, what is the number one DIY mistake you have seen with your speaker kits? Uh, number one. You don't have to name the client. You don't have to name anything. Just number one mistake that you've ever seen. I don't know if this is necessarily as big an issue with our kits because uh, most of our customers end up buying the flat pack. But I would say in general, the number one issue that we see is people. Uh, either like changing the cabinet drastically enough to affect the sound or they want to swap out like a driver that, you know, they say, Hey, I want to use this other tweeter in place of your tweeter or, or in place of your woofer. I want to use this other woofer. Cause as soon as you start swapping drivers, you have, you need a completely new crossover and right. it becomes a completely different speaker. Yeah. Or if you decide to make the try, uh, the speaker triangle instead. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Uh, anything you want to add to that, Dan? Uh, yeah, well, just just want to reiterate. I mean, we haven't had, we really haven't had any notable mistakes with our kits. Like I said, we tried really hard to avoid that, and I think we did a pretty good job of that. Right. Um, so, with with our kits in particular, haven't really seen any mistakes. Um, but like Carrie said, yeah, I see that a lot. Uh, you know, on the forums that we go on, where people say, "Hey, I want to build this speaker, but instead of this tweeter, this mid range, and this woofer, I want these." tweeters mid ranges of woofers and i want this cabinet and it's like yeah well it's not the same speaker anymore at all <laughs> I, I would say too that i you know one of the just to reiterate kind of on like why we did the crossover boards the way we did mm -hmm. one of the biggest problems we've seen uh with our years on the the diy boards is people coming on and saying hey i don't know if this crossover is assembled right something sounds funny because they're trying to read it from a schematic and hook everything up that way and they may not yeah. have an electrical background where they really know what they're looking at and, and that's kind of what was the impetus for us to build the crossover boards the way that we did, where you've got everything laid out on the top and then everything marked on the bottom so you know exactly where to connect everything. So it keeps it nice and clean looking and you get a very professional looking product in the end, uh, but it, it's super easy to put together. You know, it's like yeah. by the numbers. Yeah, it, it was it was uh, extremely, extremely uh, easy to do. It was like a puzzle, um, to tell you the truth. Um, let's see here. Okay, so I guess I guess um, what is the uh, aside from your kids? What is the? I think it's gonna get pretty funny. What is the number one DIY uh, speaker mistake you've ever seen? Um, the number number one epic fail that you've ever seen? Uh man, well, we, we kind of already talked about it a little bit. People swapping out things and then because uh, you you'll honestly not, not with not with your kids. Something something else. Yeah, it, it just uh, oh general. Yeah, so you'll see people trying to build someone else's design online, and they will swap out a you know they swap something out completely, make it it's essentially a totally new speaker, and then they say, hey, this design sounds like crap, and you're like, well, it's not the same design at all. You didn't design what what they told you to build. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know if there's one big mammoth mistake that I've seen, but I see a lot of things. You know, somebody's somebody's router gets away from them, and they you know they tear into their finished baffle. The other speaker's almost done, and they basically ruin the whole thing right at the last minute. That's, it's always horrible to see that. Um, lots of wiring mistakes on the crossover, um, you know, post a picture on the forums and, Hey, what's wrong with this? And then everybody's, you know, staring at their screen and putting their nose right up against it, trying to, trying to look at the wiring and, and see what's wrong. Um, I, I don't know that I, that, so that one sticks out to me. Well, I have, I have one, uh, that may, that may make you guys laugh. Um, so I had a friend, it's not me. Um, I'm just saying it's not me. I wasn't this, uh, enthusiastic. I had a friend who introduced me to, uh, DIY speakers and, uh, he decided to one day, he, he woke up one day and he decided, you know what? I'm going to build a heavy ass speaker for, for God knows reason, a bookshelf speaker that's heavy. 
So he got a uh, he got a really really um, heavy plate. I think it was like 50 kilo plate, and then he put it and then he uh, uh, built it um, on with the pole. Um, um, uh, uh, so so the speaker was built uh, um, with the weight on the bottom, and then he clamped the 50 uh, another 50 kilogram or something like that on top at the end of the end of the finish. And it looked pretty ridiculous. The the most ridiculous thing was that we couldn't lift it out of his um, out of his. We couldn't lift his finished speaker. Like none of like it was so awkward too. The weight distribution was just re- really really weird, and none of us could lift it. So we just looked at it and we just said, "Okay, um, that's not gonna go anywhere." <laughs> I think I think it may be still sitting in his wood shop. <laughs> so that's uh, that's the number one mistake I've ever seen. Just making it way too heavy for you to, uh, you to lift it out out, out of there. On the opposite end of that, we've actually seen some people build speakers out of cardboard before. <laughs> oh, oh my! Yeah. yeah. Well, actually, you know, I, I'm not gonna name anyone, but I've seen uh, some um, audiophile YouTubers um, uh, put out uh, uh, cardboard built open baffle speakers. So, anyways, <laughs> yeah. as long as it makes you happy. You guys also make your own drivers, uh, like you mentioned. Uh, what motivated you to do so? Um, is this, I guess, you guys just took it over, or, or um, what are, you know, uh, how are they different or advantageous compared to other drivers in the market, like SP Acoustics or ScanSpeak? Um, what's special about your drivers in particular? Well, so I think our drivers, uh, as Dan has kind of already mentioned, uh, we we wanted to get really high quality drivers that could do exactly what we wanted. Uh, so when we took over the company, the, the LD22, which is in the kit that you have right now, and the LDW7, the woofer, uh, you know, were already being produced. So we kept those on because after we did measurements and listening tests of them, uh, we really liked them. Uh, and, and I think the, the biggest reason we continue to make those is, you know, they're at the quality level of something like a ScanSpeak. So like the, the woofer that we have competes with anything ScanSpeak makes, with anything with SB Acoustic makes. And but the fact that we're making them for us and we're buying them in much larger quantities uh, gives us the ability to sell our kits at cheaper prices than if we were to go out and buy a, a ScanSpeak woofer. So if we went and bought woofers directly from ScanSpeak, you know we'd have to charge another two hundred dollars or or more for the kit, even though awesome. you may not get any better quality. Awesome. Um, a uh, uh, trick question here. Um, I think. When you say quality drivers, what does that consist of? Um, is it the magnet, the, the voice coil? Or, uh, what, what do you mean exactly by uh, quality drivers? What makes a driver quality? Uh, yeah, so it's mainly uh, the, the motor and the suspension. Are the, the two? I guess the cone plays a role too, obviously in the frequency response, because if you've got a, a, a really bad breakup low in the frequency range, it may not be usable. But for the most part, the, the two things that are going to pl- probably play the biggest impact on the sound, in, in my opinion, are the motor and the suspension, because that's where most of the distortion is going to come from. Uh, so those two things help limit the distortion and let the driver play cleaner uh, and louder or, um, you know, things like that are, are probably what I would consider the most important. Yeah, and, and just like a just like a crossover, you know, the design that goes into a crossover, these these drivers have to be designed too. So, y- you need high quality materials, high quality magnets. Um, you need everything to be tight tolerances. There's so there's the there's the design element, then there's the manufacturing element, then there's the build quality. So all these things play a role in in making a driver that is going to produce flat frequency response with low distortion and then last for a long time as well. Um, so so that's I think that's what we mean by a quality driver all of the above that are going to lead to the best sound quality. I see. Awesome. Um, so what, what's in store uh, for CSS Audio going further um, into the future? What, what are some of the future plans that you guys have with the company? Uh, so I think we're sending you uh, the new tweeter that we just brought back. So we uh, took a tweeter that he, uh, the old owner had had in production at one point. So it uses an XBL squared motor like our subwoofers. Uh, and we made some improvements on it, fixed some quality control issues that they had in the past and are re-releasing that as a, an upgrade to our current kits. Uh, so that'll be like an easy swap for customers that already have one of our kits. Uh, it'll be a new crossover that they have to assemble and then swapping in the new tweeter. Um, and then we're working on a a three-way, uh, like a base (laughs) unit for our speakers that you can just add on. So if you've already bought the kit and want to make it a three-way, you just buy this woofer module with an additional crossover that you plug in, uh, to basically convert your speaker to a three-way. 
Um, we've also got a, we're, we're trying to bring uh, in a 15 inch subwoofer, which may not be as relevant for uh, your group of, uh, or for your audience, because we, we don't sell any of our subwoofers finished yet. We're looking at maybe doing that sometime in the future, but I think those are the three big things on our plate right now. Anything that I missed, Dan? No, that's that's what we've got in the works right this second. I mean, I mean, we we'd like to do all kinds of stuff. This this is very intriguing to us on a lot of levels, and and there's you know, we'd like to bring out one of everything if 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 we could, but it all it all takes time and and money to develop this stuff. So that's what's on our plate right now, and moving forward, who knows what we'll do? Yeah, and uh, just to add, you know, I think uh, one thing that I want to um, add to this is. You know, I just love the fact that you can upgrade. It's like basically future proof. So if you guys come up with a new tweeter, then, you know, you can switch it out from the cabinet because um, everything is built, you know, it's, it's your kit. So um, I right. love the, I love, love about that. Uh, just to um, um, add on to what Kerry was saying, uh, they're sending me the uh, new tweeter and then I guess uh, the, the new crossover that um, that's an upgrade option for the current 1TD kit. Um, and they can you can also upgrade the uh, the crossover in the kit as well. And this is all like basically future proof. If they come up with a you know better crossover or something like that, then it's upgradable. Uh, for example, uh, you don't get yes. that with you know manufactured speakers. You know the manufacturers ain't gonna send you a crossover with a new tweeter. You know to make your uh, X1 version X2, right? So um, that's something I really like about that. Um, last question. Um, well, I guess that's pretty much end of my questions um, I have here. I think we've been talking for about 46 minutes. Um, is there anything you guys want to add to this interview? Anything else that you guys want to shine light to? Um, so one of the things we, I think we've been discussing that would be maybe good to get some feedback from your audience on is uh, we, we're looking at potentially bringing in uh, like a cheaper option for our finished cabinets that are like a cabinet that you can self-assemble or, or I guess the cabinet would already be assembled and finished. You would just assemble all of the other parts. We could ship it as a, but it, it'd be uh, more like a standard speaker. So maybe just a basic veneer or a, or even a vinyl finish, but something that's more like somewhere in between what we sell right now and the, and the kit. So it's a customer doesn't have to necessarily worry about doing the finishing work on the, on the cabinet. So they get something that looks decent, but then they still get the high end sound that we, we offer, but we haven't really, we, we don't know if there's enough demand there yet, or if that's something people are interested in or not. I see. Yeah. So, uh, guys, uh, if you guys don't mind, uh, comment down below. I'll also make a community, uh, poll as well, uh, for, for you guys to see, uh, if there's any demand there. Um, so just to uh, re-clarify what Kerry was saying there. Um, so you finish the speakers and now I have to go and veneer and finish it, you know, uh, to my own choice. Um, what Kerry here is talking about is already a finished uh, cabinet that you can assemble. Right, Kerry? Yeah, essentially. Right. But more of a simple version. Um, if you guys, so that you guys don't have to go out there and uh, finish it yourself um, uh, or, you know, keep the MDF look. Um, so if you guys are interested, comment down below, let uh, Carrie and Dan know. And uh, yeah, so Dan, anything you want to add to the interview? Uh, just, just to continue on that point a little bit. I mean, when we, when we first started doing the DIY kits, we wanted to offer a finished speaker kind of to highlight what your, what your listeners have noticed in the past is that there is a huge discrepancy in price there. And it is due to the cabinet for the most part. You know, the, the actual guts of a speaker that make it sound as beautiful as it does are actually not that costly, but, but a nicely finished cabinet will quadruple your price. And so we've got, we wanted to offer that to show that. And now we're trying to feel out the waters and say, hey, is there a middle ground? Something where you can still get a little bit of the assembly to, to satisfy that itch that people have, um, but also end up with something nice that they don't have to do so much work with. So we're just trying yeah, to feel that. I think I I think that there will be a demand. Personally uh, speaking, um, um, well, I'll, I'll let the guys, uh, the the viewers, speak in the comment section. But I think there's a demand for it because it's also like an upgrade um, option as well. So for example, if I have a limited amount of, amount of budget, then I can initially buy the MDF uh, cabinetry, right? And uh, uh, and either either one, you know, I can finish it later um, when I get the money to finish it. Or, you know, I can buy the, uh, the um, finished cabinet uh, that you guys uh, may offer in the future. So there's That's an up upgrade option, right? So I think because a lot of us, uh, you know, we, we spend money in bits, right? We, we, most of us, I'm talking for the average Joes out there, um, you know, it, it, we don't have, you know, 
you know, a, a lot of money to drop in front of us, but then we may be able, you know, we like the idea of upgrading, right? So I think that's something that um, people may be interested in, but I'll let the viewers uh, speak for themselves. Okay, so I think uh, that's pretty much it. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Carrie and Dan, for this interview. And I hope you guys keep safe. I hope everyone keeps safe. And uh, I'll see you guys uh, in the next one. Yeah, thanks for thanks having me. Appreciate it. Talk to you later. Take care.